fourth chapter of the gospel according to St. John, the uh, 46th verse. So Jesus came again into Cain of Galilee, where he made the water wine. And there was a certain nobleman whose son was sick at Capernaum. When he heard that Jesus was come out of Judea into Galilee, he went unto him and besought him that he would come down and heal his son, for he was at the point of death. Then said Jesus unto him, Except ye see signs and wonders, ye will not believe. The nobleman saith unto him, Sir, come down ere my child die. Jesus saith unto him, Go thy way, thy son liveth. And the man believed the word that Jesus had spoken unto him, and he went his way. And as he was now going down, his servants met him and told him, saying, Thy son liveth. Then inquired he of them the hour when he began to amend. And they said unto him, Yesterday at the seventh hour the fever left him. So the father knew that it was the same hour in the which Jesus said unto him, Thy son liveth and himself believed, and his whole house. This is again the second miracle that Jesus did when he came out of Judea into Galilee. Let's bow our heads a moment in prayer. Our Father, we're so grateful and thankful for thy precious holy word, for thy word is truth. The Master said, ye shall know the truth, the truth shall make you free. Thank you for the privilege to feed upon the word of God. Thank you for the Holy Spirit whom you've sent to be our teacher and guide. And we trust him today to unveil and to unfold and to reveal the word of God unto our spirits. In Jesus' holy name, amen. Amen. Praise God. I'm going to, these next few lessons, do something that I always wanted to do and just never have done. And that is just take the miracles of healing, the individual cases primarily, we will look at others, of Jesus, and just look at them in detail, just see what happened. This is the first healing. You notice the, the scripture tells us that this is the second miracle that he wrought. The first miracle was in the second chapter of John. You remember he turned the water into wine. And so this uh, nobleman's son is the first person that was healed under the ministry of Jesus. Now, isn't it interesting, too? And you know, I'm, I, I, I was really led and have been for some time in my spirit to, to go back over these cases and just look at them in detail. Let's not be in a hurry about it, you know. Just look at it in detail because we find a lot of things that will interest us and will help us. Now, isn't it interesting to learn that the first person that was healed under the ministry of Jesus was not healed instantly? Isn't that interesting? And isn't it interesting that the Bible calls that a miracle, said this second miracle Jesus wrought, and the nobleman's son began to amend from that hour. Began to amend, that means he began, the fever left him, and then he just began to get better and better and better and better and better. And convalescent until he's finally all right. Isn't that correct? You see, we missed it. I, I was uh, talking to Brother Oral Roberts, and, and, uh, or we were talking, I should say, and, and uh, he said, uh, you know, I think we missed it in that we just expected everybody to be healed instantly. And then he went on to talk about someone that he'd prayed for, and uh, this person never had grown. Their body never developed, you see. And now then a grown person, I think 28 years of age or something, and, or in the early 30s, and, and after Brother Roberts had laid hands on them in recent time and prayed for them, now they started growing. See, they didn't just suddenly, they're six feet tall, but they just started growing at that age. And the doctors are following it. They're amazed, and every now and then they measure. And, and they, they said, well, man, they've grown some more. I mean, just a natural growth like, you know. 
And, and uh, the last account he had, he was just almost to where he should be. Well, now, you know, the Bible calls that a miracle, too. I said, the Bible calls that a miracle, too. The Bible calls this man beginning to amend and finally becoming all right, this second miracle Jesus wrought, doesn't it? I said, doesn't it? Yes. Amen, yes. And so, uh, Brother Robert said then, when uh, the doctors are following this closely, you know, and they're just absolutely amazed, you see, that a person would start growing when they're up here, you know, 30 years of age or somewhere. I don't know. I, I forgot just when it was. But, but somewhere in that vicinity from 28 to 33 years of age. Well, now, you see, a lot of times we'd, we'd just maybe see a fellow there in a wheelchair, you know, and you'd think, well, well, now, why don't those legs just, that's it. Well, they, they could, I mean, if God did it that way. But see, who are we to tell God how to do it? And we shouldn't turn the switch of faith off because it isn't an instant something. See, I think we missed a lot here. Because people didn't get an instant manifestation, they, they either were in unbelief to begin with and they just stayed there or else they slipped back into it and said, well, that didn't work for me. That didn't work for me. And of course, they cut off whatever started. Then they stopped whatever started. Are you following me? Well, uh, let's, let's examine this in detail here. Uh, you'll find that uh, this miracle of healing seems to speak particularly to our time. It teaches us that we do not need the physical and visible presence of our Lord to heal us. You see, Jesus was not there in person to minister to this young man, son, whoever. His Father, the nobleman, had said, Come, you know, my son is sick, nigh unto death. Come that he may be healed. He's at the point of death. He wanted him to come, but Jesus didn't go. He was not there in person, physical, I'm talking about. Well, now that should speak to us, you know. Some folks have said, well, if I could have just been there when Jesus was here in person, I'd have sure got healed. Well, he doesn't have to be there in person for you to get healed. This man was healed at a distance, wasn't he? Well, thank God. Though this man was, Jesus was far from this sick child. I suppose he was a child. He just called him his son. He could have been a teenager. Could have been a young man. I don't know. But anyway, it just said he was, he was far from him. Yet he just simply spoke a word. Did you notice that? Just simply said unto him, unto the nobleman, Go thy way, thy son liveth. Now get this. And the man believed the word that Jesus had spoken unto him and went his way. What did he believe? The word. Hallelujah. The word that Jesus had spoken unto him and went his way. Now he had no physical evidence that his son was healed. And evidently it was some distance because it was the next day before he got home. And some of his people met him, you know, and said, Thy son liveth. And so he asked, you see, they inquired of them the hour that he began to amend. And they said unto him yesterday, at the seventh hour, the fever left him. So you see, this is the next day that the nobleman's coming home. And all that time, you see, all night long, and from the seventh hour of yesterday until today, the next day, 
He had no physical evidence that his child was any better. Can't you just imagine if the devil hounded his mind and said, well, he's probably dead by now. You've just took the word of that preacher. He's probably dead by now. He believed that which was spoken unto him. It said he believed and the man believed the word that Jesus had spoken. Now what had Jesus spoken? Go thy way, thy son liveth. He believed that. Now, it was by simple faith then and the faith of this son's father that he was healed. It was by simple faith without sight or without signs. Amen. Now you see what Jesus had said to the man? That 46 verse said, there was a certain nobleman whose son was sick at Capernaum. When he heard that Jesus, when the nobleman heard that Jesus was come out of Judea into Galilee, he went unto him and besought him that he would come down and heal his son, for he was at the point of death. Then Jesus said unto him, now isn't that strange? For this man besought Jesus, come down and heal my son. He is at the point of death. And Jesus said to him, except you see signs and wonders, you'll not believe. The nobleman said unto him, evidently still didn't get what Jesus was saying to him. Now listen. The nobleman said unto him, sir, come down ere my child die. Jesus saith unto him, go thy way, thy son liveth. Now, he didn't see any sign, and he didn't see any wonder. And the man believed the word that Jesus had spoken unto him and went his way. Let's go over it again. There was a certain nobleman whose son was sick at Capernaum. 46th verse, latter part of it, 47th verse. When he, the nobleman whose son was sick at Capernaum, heard that Jesus was come out of Judea into Galilee, he went unto him and besought him that he would come down and heal his son, for he was at the point of death. Then said Jesus unto him, in other words, the man said, come down and heal my son, he is at the point of death. And Jesus said to him, isn't that a strange thing to say to a fellow? Jesus said to him, except you see signs and wonders, you will not believe. The nobleman said unto him, see, he didn't even get what Jesus was saying to him right at the moment. The nobleman said unto him, sir, come down ere my child die. And Jesus said unto him, go thy way, thy son liveth. And the man believed the word. Now you see what Jesus is saying? He's trying to, and, and actually is leading this man away from all but simple faith in his word. Except ye see signs and wonders, ye will not believe. Jesus said. And then he tested that man's faith by a simple word. Go thy way, thy son liveth. And the man accepted the hard lesson. Believed the naked word and the child was made whole. You see, a lot of people, if they could see something, then they'll start, except you see signs and wonders, you'll not believe. But you see, that's not the Bible kind of faith. 
Are you listening to me? See, what Jesus is doing, he's trying to move him away from what we call natural human faith or sense knowledge faith or faith that's based on what it sees or faith that's based on what it hears, you see, or faith that's based on seeing something or feeling something or having some kind of manifestation to build on. Jesus is endeavoring to move that fellow away from that kind of faith into just simple faith in his word. And he was successful in doing it. Glory to God. Go thy way. See, the man didn't see any sign. The man didn't see any wonder performed. Go thy way. Thy son liveth. Now notice, and he believed the sign. No, he believed the word. Oh, glory to God. I've done it again. I've already preached me happy. <laughs> Hallelujah. Amen. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Praise the Lord. Amen. See, that man showed his faith by just quietly going back home with no evidence, nothing he could see to base his faith on except what Jesus said. No physical evidence, no sign, no wonder. Now, most folks would have said, well, uh, he said that, go thy way as thy son live. I'll believe it, you know, when I hear that he's alive. Well, he had heard that he's dead is what he'd heard. Because he's already at the point of death, wasn't he? Because, you see, it was his faith in what Jesus said that brought it to pass. You need to get that. I said it was his faith in what Jesus said that brought it to pass. It's our faith in what God has said in his word that brings it to pass in our lives. See, people say sometimes, well, now, I, I can't get that to work for me. That doesn't work for me. I don't understand. You know, it worked for them, but don't work for me. Well, you can readily see why it doesn't work for them. It's their faith that brings it to pass in their lives. So then we can see this. Another thought here is that this case begins at a fixed moment and develops quietly and gradually. It was not an instant healing, just like many are healed that way today. He inquired of them the hour he began to amend. And the answer was that at a certain moment the fever broke. And now then he was convalescent. He was getting better naturally and just, you know, he began to amend. Well, does the Lord work that way? Well, emphatically, yes. We bring out this fact that uh, we've had seven people healed of cancer that's been in these meetings. And five of them were uh, terminal cases, you know. Doctors had already fixed a date, so to speak, for them to die. One of them sat right here where you were sitting. Some of you are sitting in the same room here. The doctors had said to him, I mean, cancer clinics, you know, you got one month to live. But now then, the same doctors, you see, can't find a trace of the cancer about them. Same doctors, same cancer specialists, running the same tests, can't find it. See, these are all confirmed by medical science. These five terminal cases are all confirmed by medical science that they're now well. And every one of them was healed this way. Not a one of them received an instant manifestation. See, this is biblical, too. We need to realize that. Here's a good testimony. I'll not read everything this lady said because she wrote quite a long letter, but, but uh, here's an illustration. And she says here that I was healed in one of your services in the Lakewood Church on March the 23rd of this year of lung cancer. Hallelujah. Now, I'm not saying that I was healed instantly. I wasn't. But the manifestation began the moment you laid hands on me. Glory be to God. You see, I am a Southern Baptist, 32 years old, and the mother of two young daughters. My condition was extremely serious. In fact, I found out later that my doctor did not expect me to live but a few weeks, and that was in February. 
In January, my doctors found me to have pneumonia in my left lung. To my surprise, they also found hidden under the pneumonia multiple tumors, which were malignant. I previously, five years ago, had breast cancer on the right side. My doctors, thinking possibly that uh, the cancer was hormone-fed, put me in the hospital, operated on me to remove my ovaries, thus shutting off my hormone. He also began chemotherapy in February. I had only one treatment of chemotherapy when she came into our meetings. Now she said, being Baptist, I was skeptical of your tactics. <laughs> each night, now each night, now listen to this carefully, please. Each night you laid hands on me. Evidently she got in the healing line every night. I felt nothing. And then the last night you were there, your teaching was based on Mark 16, 15 through 18. I have never heard a sermon preached on that passage. I believed, now listen, and you'll get the clue, you see. It's almost parallel to what happened here. I believed what you said. Prayed to God to forgive me for being blind and asked him to heal me in the name of Jesus. The moment you laid hands on me, I got hot from the top of my head to the soles of my feet. That was that healing power of God that went into it. See. I fell and hit the floor. And I didn't even know why. Thank God I know now. From then on, now that's March the 23rd, you see, I began to get better. I believed. Mark 11, 23 and 24. See, I taught on that. When you pray, believe you received. And she continued to confess that. Now then, here's the outcome of it. I had two places of tumors in my lungs. One was large, and uh, the other wasn't so large. But in April, see, now that was March the 23rd, and in April, the large one was gone. They couldn't find it. In June, the other tumor was gone. Praise God. Doctors just are baffled about it. They can't understand it. From that hour, she began to amend Hallelujah. And she went on to say, I don't, uh, there's two more pages here. These are quite long pages. That, uh, that she's doing all of her housework, mowing the yard, <laughs> doing things you never did, mowing the yard, you see, and just never felt better. Glory to God. So thankful. Well, isn't that just like our wonderful Jesus? Amen. From this story of this second miracle that Jesus did, as recorded in the fourth chapter of John, then we must learn, we must learn to accept both. What did I say both? Both instant healings and gradual healings. They're all in the plan of God. We must accept both. We must learn to accept this fact, that is to count the death blow struck at the moment of our believing. Can you see that in this moment of this lung cancer? That's the moment that she accepted the death blow to that cancer struck. Hallelujah to Jesus. And it came into being. Praise to God. So look at it again. Then inquired he of them the hour when he began to amend. That's the 52nd verse. They said unto him yesterday at the seventh hour, the fever left him. So the father knew that it was at the same hour in which Jesus said unto him, Thy son liveth, and himself believed in his whole house. That is, believed in Jesus. He already believed the word he said. This again, the second miracle that Jesus did when he was come out of Judah into Galilee. 
All right, now then turn back to Mark's gospel. We're just going to take these one by one. Dissect them. Learn. Mark the second chapter. And we'll start, or the first chapter rather, and we'll start reading here at the 29th verse. And forthwith, when they were come out of the synagogue, they entered into the house of Simon and Andrew with James and John. But Simon's wife and mother lay sick of a fever, and anon they tell him of her. And he came and took her by the hand and lifted her up, and immediately the fever left her, and she ministered unto them. Now this particular account is given to us by Matthew and Mark and, and Luke also. So let's turn back to the 8th chapter and read the account there, the 8th chapter of Matthew, of the same healing. Matthew, the 8th chapter, and we'll start reading with the 14th verse. And when Jesus was coming to Peter's house, now she called him Simon over in the other place, Simon Peter, you know, Peter's house, he saw his mother-in-law laid and sick of a fever, and he touched her hand, and the fever left, and she arose and ministered unto them. Now then, let's go further. Let's go over to the fourth chapter of Luke's gospel. The fourth chapter of Luke's gospel. I want you to follow me now, because it's very interesting. We'll find out some very interesting things in regard to these healings and this healing. All right, now this is the fourth chapter of the gospel according to St. Luke. We'll start reading with the 38th verse. And he arose out of the synagogue and entered into Simon's house. And Simon's wife's mother was taken with a great fever. Now, you see the word great's added. The other just said fever, but said a great fever. I guess we would say a high fever. And they besought him for her. And he stood over her and rebuked the fever, and it left her immediately. She arose and ministered unto them. Now, I guess it would be very interesting here to uh, read Luke's account because Luke was a doctor. So he adds the word, I'm sure is inspired by the Spirit of God, but he adds the word great there in connection with fever, great fever. I, like I said, I suppose we'd say high fever. And then maybe he, being a doctor, would watch a little bit more closely or see just what happened here, be more interested in what happened. Maybe than others would. I've seen things happen that I gave my account of it. And somebody else saw some things I didn't see. Both of them were right. Luke says, now the other two just simply said, one of them said he, he touched her hand. The other one said he took her by the hand and lifted her up. You see, Mark said he took her by the hand and lifted her up. Matthew said he touched her hand. Just touched her hand. Luke says here, that uh, he stood over her and rebuked the fever. And it left her. Well, you say, which one of them are correct? All of them. All of them are. He did all of those things. He stood over and rebuked the fever. He touched her hand. He took her by the hand, lifted up. He just said immediately she got up. He didn't say whether he anybody lifted her up or not. But, but the others said they did. Well, now, this is very interesting. Let's, let's just think about this healing now. Jesus had just come out from the synagogue where amid the astonishment of the people, he had he cast out a demon, you know. You can read that in this first chapter of, of uh, Mark here. And he entered here into Peter's house. Now, this is in Capernaum. I was there in 1969 and stood right there on the ground, the very uh, ruins of the synagogue of Capernaum. Actually, you see, in digging there, they, uh, they found the stones, the thing's been cast down, but, you know, they fit together. They put some of them back together, not all of them, but just enough of it where you could see the outline of the building and part of it, you see. 
then Peter's house, as you come out the front of the synagogue, is not far there to it. Just, oh, I don't know I, how to judge it. I wouldn't say it's maybe 50 yards or 75 yards. And uh, actually, they had only found this house. Uh, they were still excavating when we were there in 69. Because through the centuries, you see, uh, they'd been covered up with dirt and so on and so forth. So in digging there, they found this. They, they, they knew from the scripture it had to be close there, you see, because he entered into the house, came right out of the one, entered into the other. So they were still digging, so you couldn't get in because they had it uh, roped off, but uh, you could see some things. Now, how did you know it's Peter's house or his mother-in-law's house? Well, for the simple reason that, you see, they found some things there that whereby they knew it was Peter's house. Now, among other things, they found a baptistry where they baptized people. It's right on the sea there, Galilee. Why didn't they baptize them there? Well, you've got to realize that these Jews were under great uh, pressure. For you to come right out in the open and confess some things, sometimes it almost meant your life, your livelihood. And so they had a baptistry in this house. But there's no doubt about it, but what, that's the house that they went into. And Peter's wife's mother was lying sick of fever. Notice that Jesus evidently recognized another agency back of the fever. For it said, he rebuked the fever. Doesn't it? Luke said that. He rebuked the fever. This implies by him rebuking the fever, this implies some personal and evil agent that must have caused it. He would not rebuke, you know, wouldn't be any point in rebuking just a mere natural condition. Rebuke the fever. Thank God. The fever left her. Notice he said he left. Something very interesting, you know, over there in the 19th chapter of Acts, we've looked at again and again, 11th and 12th verses. And God wrought special miracles by the hands of Paul, so that from his body were brought unto the sick handkerchiefs or aprons, and the diseases departed from them, and the evil spirits went out of them. Well, you can see, and we'll look at some more of these cases a little later on, that the uh, evil spirits and demons and the devil stands back of sickness. And sometimes, now don't just go around, you know, trying to do everything just alike always. That's the reason you have to depend on the Spirit of God to show you. Sometimes they have to be rebuked before a person will be. And they've got to leave before there'll be a healing. I know in uh, praying with a pastor's wife who was bedfast with terminal cancer. That is, we were praying, the Spirit of God said, go stand at the head of the bed and say, come out. Thy spirit of doubt and fear. None believe. And I did, and she got up instantly. She's bed fast. She couldn't get up. She couldn't even get up and go to the bathroom. She's bed fast. She's so weak and so far gone, it almost has to be turned. Somebody has to turn her. She can't turn herself over. I've had seen many cases of cancer heal, and that's the only one that saw heal that way. So I didn't go around rebuking the spirit of doubt and unbelief or fear and unbelief, never cancer patient. Never have any more of them. Just because God leads you, the Spirit of God leads you to deal a certain way with one case doesn't mean that you deal that way with every case. Amen. Are you following me? Amen. See, we learn a lot by following the Scriptures, but we also learn by following the Holy Ghost. 
not only in the areas of healing, but we need to realize in dealing with people to be filled with the Spirit or dealing with people for salvation, you don't always, there are certain principles, but you don't always deal with everybody just alike. Because different people have different hang-ups. And just because something worked with one doesn't mean that God wants you to do that with everybody. Are you following me? Now, you know, a time or two in dealing with people to be filled with the Holy Ghost. Oh, I can remember twice in all these years. I've had the Spirit of God to tell me to tell a person. See, and, and, and I, I don't like it. I don't like to do it. I don't like to. And I've never made a practice of it. Because, see, God was just telling me that for that one individual. And it worked just like magic for them. But then I don't go around trying to make that work for everybody. Different, different ways sometimes to get them to yield to the Spirit of God. I was preaching right here in the state of Oklahoma and there's a young lady that was, uh, well, every time, you know, we ministered, well, she was there for me to lay hands on her to be filled with the Holy Ghost. Well, I knew all the time from the first time I'd laid hands on her, what was the matter with her, but I didn't, uh, what was hindered, in other words, from receiving, but I, I didn't tell her because she probably wouldn't accept it or might even got upset about it and not come back to the services. So if you keep them coming, you know, well, you could get them maybe eventually in. And so one night, I was laying hands on people again. But, you know, this is about the third week. And she's been up every, he, every line. I'd put people in the same line to be healed and be filled with the Spirit. And so this night, I, I sat in the chair on the platform. I laid hands on her, you know. And I knew the Spirit of God came on her, but she just wouldn't speak out in tongue. And I said to her, because the Spirit of God spoke to me, see. I said to her, now, sister, she's a young lady. She's a young married lady somewhere in her early, early 20s. I said, uh, you walk down that aisle. See, there's three second seats in this church auditorium. The, the Lord told me to tell you. That's the reason I'm telling you. You walk down that aisle with your hands uplifted, praising God, and, and back up this aisle, around, around this center section. You go around three times, and the third time you go around, you'll be speaking in tongues. She did. Third time she went around, she's talking in tongues. Well, now, you don't put up everybody walking around the center section, do you? Isn't that right? Now, now, why did that work for her? Well, there's something about it that why did Jesus tell the man after he had made clay of the spittle and rubbed it on his eyes, you know, spit, you know, and mud, dirt, and go wash it off in the pool of Siloam. Now she'll come again sin. Why did he tell him that? You see, sometimes folks have to do something to get the faith to work it. And then again, sometimes... Right in front of everybody, the whole crowd. This woman, this young lady is so bashful and so backward and so shy that she just can't turn loose. You know, the power of God's on her and speak with tongues right there in front of everybody. But walking around in front of everybody with, the, with her hands uplifted, praising God in English, just broke some of that something down, you see, where she could yield to the Spirit. You see, God knows. That's what I'm saying to you. Now, time or two in praying with people in the prayer room, I, I, I've used this illustration because God gave it to me. See, I, I knew the Spirit of God was giving them utterance, but they were not yielding to the utterance. They're waiting for something to take their tongue away from them and make them talk. Are you following me? Or like one fellow said, some people think it's sort of like somebody swallowed a little radio, you know. <laughs> and when God gets ready, he just turns it on, just automatically start talking. You don't have anything to do with it, see. Well, I happen to say to this person, you see, because, you know, some of you younger people may not know about it, but I used to go out on the farm, my grandpa's old farm, and uh, also my grandmother's farm on the other side of the family. And, and out there in the country, you see, they had a, a pump there at the well. They didn't have running water in the house those days when I was a kid. Since then, you know, they put electric pumps on the wells and got running water out in the country, but they didn't have it then, you know. You pump this water out. Well, some way or another, I don't know why, they, they tried to explain it to me, and I didn't understand altogether, but some way or another, you, uh, you, you had to prime the pump. So they'd leave a little can of water here, you see, on, on, on the top, and, and you pour that water, same time you're pumping this, see, and you pour that water on that, you know, and it primes the pump, and it just starts flowing out. So the Lord said to me, I was praying with this person, never done anything like that before, and only done it once since. In the prayer room, and the Lord, and this person understood because they happened to be from the country, you know. And I asked them that, you see, the Lord gave me this illustration, said, tell them you're going to prime the pump. 
And I, I explained to them. They understood, yeah, I said, used to, you know, I'd grandpa's house just like it was to me. He used to pump that old pump, you know. I said, well, you know, they poured that water on top. Yeah. I said, all right, now here's what the Lord told me, see. Because, see, I knew the Spirit was there getting utterance. Now, now to begin with, I'm going to prime the pump. I'm going to start talking tongue. You just talk like I do, you see. When I stop, you go on speaking. And they immediately begin to speak. Yet I don't like to do that with everybody. In fact, I don't. I've only done it with two people for the simple reason that you don't set up a method and this is the way you do it. See how the Spirit of God's are leading you to do with that person. Amen. Are, are you following me? Amen. Now, one other time I've had the Lord to tell me to tell somebody that way and I've done that. But see, it'd be very easy then for me just to adopt that as a method, you see, of getting everybody filled with the Spirit. But I won't do that. Just won't do that. We don't want to set down methods, you see, anymore. You've got to be filled this way. You've got to be healed this way or that way. I mean, learn that the Spirit of God works with different people in different ways because people are different. Amen. What'll help one might turn somebody else off and turn them away. And so I just use that for about the Holy Ghost as an illustration. I, I, I think you can see that here, that you just don't always, even in the case of a fever, always rebuke the situation. Like I was talking about cancer now, see? This one, and I've had a lot of people healed of cancer. And, and, and that's the only one, and I only did that because the Spirit of God said do it. Now, I was praying for one person to be filled with the Holy Ghost. I'd prayed to them, I don't know how many times. See, in a church meeting, back in the prayer room, you know? Now, listen to this. See, to be filled with the Holy Ghost. And actually, this is how I learned some things. I wasn't really as obedient to the Spirit of God as I should be because... For the last two or three nights, I had an urge just to say to that person, I rebuke this spirit of doubt and loose you from it. But I, I got over into the sense realm, you know, my natural thinking, because see, they're a member of this church, full gospel church. They couldn't, they couldn't be in doubt. They believe in the Holy Ghost. What are they doing in the prayer room to receive? <laughs> you see what I'm talking about? They believe in the Holy Ghost. And so... Uh, I didn't do that. But now this third night, you see, I was praying with them. And, and you know, I, I knew the Holy Ghost give them utterance. I talked to them. And, and they admitted themselves. Their tongue seemed to want to say something. It wasn't English, you know. And I said, well, just yield to that and speak it out. Praise God. Don't, don't resist it. And uh, work with them, you know. And they just went on working with some other folks. Well, as I remember, everybody got filled with the Holy Ghost with them. They're still there hung up. And almost without thinking, almost just like I was angry. You know, they're still standing there. We were standing. We weren't kneeling because there's not enough room for all of us to kneel in this prayer room. <laughs> and they're still standing there, you know, just sort of mumbling a few words of praise in English with a look of disappointment on their face. And everybody else, as far as I remember, got filled with the Spirit and received. So I just walked over there to this person and almost, it seemed like in anger, just took hold of his shoulder and said, I rebuke the spirit of doubt in the name of Jesus. When I said that, they just started talking in tongues instantly. I said, I could have done that two nights ago. And I didn't do that. But I don't, I, you know, I never have done that again <laughs> with somebody seeking the Holy Ghost. Now, I would if the spirit said so, you see. I don't go around. In other words, I don't set up a system now. Everybody seeking the Holy Ghost don't receive. I rebuke the spirit of doubt. See, I don't set up a system that. I, I might, you know, do that with somebody if the Lord said so, you see. I'm using that as an illustration, see, and trying to say to you the same thing's true over in the area of the healing. You don't just set up a system and say, well, you know, this is it. That's the way it works. You've always got to rebuke the devil. You've always got to rebuke this. Or you've always got to rebuke that. No, you don't. Or you always got to cast something out of somebody. No, you may, but you don't. Now, like on these cancer people, like I said, the only time that the Spirit of God said, go stand at the head of the bed and say, come out. Thy spirit of doubt and fear, fear and unbelief or doubt. And, and, and I did, and instantly, I mean, without any more praying or anything, praise God, they were released. See, that was what was holding them from receiving the healing. Yet on other, other patients, I never was led to do that. So I just didn't set up a system now in dealing with every cancer patient that I rebuked the spirit of fear and rebuked the spirit of doubt. But there may be times... That these things need to be dealt with. You see, it seems to me that it would say here from what Luke said, he rebuked the fever that he's dealing with the power that's behind this situation.
And then next thing he did, he took hold. Or we might put it this way, if we want to put it this way, we might say she took hold of the healing power which he stood over her to administer because he took her by the hand. He took her by the hand and lifted her up and she arose. Hallelujah. Now, there was his mighty touch of help and healing. But there was also her obedience. I want you to get that. There was also her obedience. That's shown by her receiving his extended hand and shown by her action in rising. We must meet his help and his power. It's not just going to fall on us like ripe cherries off of a tree. I told you about ministering here and right here in the state of Oklahoma one time and I've never done this again. I've never been led to do it again. I would if the Spirit of God said so. But I'd finish my message and ordinarily when I finish, if you've been in my crusades and these folks that have, they know usually I'll give an altar call immediately for people to come to be saved. Then to be saved and now to be saved and filled with the Spirit and sent them to the prayer room. Then I'd call for people to be saved and send them to the prayer room and then I'd put people to be healed and filled with the Spirit in the same line because we only had a limited number to deal with, you know, and understand I, I'd, I'd be able to do it. Now I can't because sometimes a hundred people come to be filled with the Spirit, you see, and sometimes even more. But uh, I, I actually started to pray, you know, you know, I finished my sermon and said, you know, let's bow our heads, you know, and I'm going to give an invitation. When the word of the Lord came unto me saying, now, you see, uh, that might need some qualifying. God speaks to any Christian, any believer, by that still small voice down here. And that's, that's most of the time where he'll talk to me as an individual. Here's something people need to realize. See, when it comes to ministry, like, for instance, ministry gift, when it comes to the prophet's ministry, you know, that isn't for your own personal use. It, it never works for you. He'll talk to you just like he talks to every Christian. He'll lead you just like he does every Christian by that still small voice on the inside. The prophet's ministry isn't for the benefit of the prophet. His ministry is for the benefit of others. And, and so the word of the Lord, not that still small voice in here, like a voice coming here from over my shoulder, like a voice coming to me, speaking to me. You know, in the Old Testament, the prophet would say, uh, the Bible would say, the word of the Lord came unto him saying, or he would say, he'd start out that way sometime, the word of the Lord came unto me saying. Well, it couldn't have been audible because if it was, he wouldn't have to tell the rest of them what he said. Everybody had heard what it said. Isn't that right? But the spirit of the prophet, you see, was, was so finely attuned uh, until he could hear when others couldn't. And that God has a purpose in that. And so it's just like a voice coming right over your shoulder, like, you know, uh, saying, before you ever give the altar call, minister right now to everybody in this congregation that has anything wrong with them from their hips down. Hips, knees, feet, ankles, crippled or whatever. Well, I just spoke out what he said. The Lord, I just said, the Lord just said, minister. And here folks came. We got a dozen people. Some of them, three or four out of the dozen, had to be carried down there. When I say carried down there, you know, halfway carried, you know, just they couldn't get down there by themselves. They had, people had to lift them up and bring them down there. So bound up with arthritis and so on. Some came down themselves on crutches and sticks, canes. Well, now, I suppose all he said, the Lord just leads you one step at a time. He don't show you the whole thing. If he did, you'd be walking by sight and not by faith, and that wouldn't please God for you to walk like that. 
I just suppose when he said minister then that he meant for me to lay hands on them. See, so just automatically suppose that. Yet while they're coming, the word of the Lord came unto me again, said, don't touch a one of them. Don't pray for them. Deal with each one individually. See, don't deal with them, all 12 of them. Sometimes you may deal with people in a group. Deal with each one of them individually and say to each one of them that I told you to tell them if they'll run down that aisle and back up this aisle, they'll be healed. Tell them to run. Well, isn't that strange? So, very first fellow standing here, I said to him, can you run? It's so startled, that poor fellow. He said, oh, no, I can't even walk, much less run. And he couldn't walk. He scooted down there. Well, I said, the Lord told me to tell you to run down that aisle and back up this and you'd be here. You think that fellow questioned that? He believed that word like this nobleman believed that word. He believed what I said. You never saw a fellow whirl and scoot so fast. I mean, he didn't run or walk, he scooted. He didn't run or walk, he scooted. You never saw a fellow scoot down the aisle so fast and scoot back up this aisle. Make a long story short, we went right down the aisle, right down the line with these 12 people standing there and the first 11 of them, every single one of them was healed as they ran. I mean, those folks, they were, they were people standing there that took three people to hold them up. And they ran right out of their arms. Everybody saw it. Everybody saw it. Till we came to the last person, which was a woman. I said, are you ready to run? Oh, no, I couldn't, Brother Hagin. I got the arthritis. Well, I said, some of these people had arthritis, and they ran. Yeah, but I know I can't. Well, I said, you got out here by yourself. You don't even have a cane or a stick. You saw people here. I asked each one of them, you see, in turn, what's wrong with you? Some others had arthritis and much worse than you. They were carried down here. Others on crutches, others with sticks and canes. You got out here by yourself, no assistance at all. And you saw them. Yeah, I know, I saw it, but I know I can't. Well, I said, all I know, sister, is just to tell you to run. She made one, two little feeble steps and stopped. Without thinking, Spirit of God within me prompted me. See, and I said to her sister, because she turned, you know, made two or three steps. Turn and look at me. She turned and I said, you didn't want to do that, did you? Something on the inside of you just rose up against what I said to you, didn't it? She said, yes, it did. I said, well, go sit down. I can't help you, neither can God. Now, what am I saying to you? I'm saying, you see, that uh, on the behalf of this woman, there was... Peter's mother-in-law, there was obedience. She got up, bless God. <laughs> Amen, isn't that right? Amen. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. There was not only his mighty touch and help, but there was her obedience. Shown by her receiving his extended hand and her action in rising. We must meet his help and his power. Then there was the use of her new strength. We need to think about that. That's something here that we need to think about. You notice what it said here? The fever left her and she ministered unto them. What are you going to do with the new strength and health that God gives you? Are you going to use it for Him? Or are you going to dissipate it on yourself? One time not too far from here, to call the name of the town, a city at least, and everybody immediately recognized who lives in this vicinity, there was a healing service, a healing line. Here a young lady came for healing. The minister said, why do you want to be healed? She said, so I can play tennis. I noticed she didn't get healed. I think it's all right people play tennis. Don't misunderstand me. But I don't think that's a good enough reason to want to be healed. I think we ought to want to be healed so we can minister to him. Amen. Amen. Are you listening? Amen. I think it's all right for the young lady to play tennis if she wants to. But that's not very high calling 
a reason to want to have God's strength and power ministered unto her. She didn't get healed, needless to say. I think it might be something here for us to think on a little bit. She rose and ministered unto them. What are we going to do with this new strength and healing and health We need to put that new strength, that new healing, and that new health to the best of use. Can you say amen? amen? You know, I think some people just want to be healed just because they're sick. Just so I can feel better. No other higher reason than that. You'll find this out, friends, that if you'll give... Once God's healed you, I know from experience of my healing, if you'll give of your new life to others and your strength to others, that you'll just have a continual renewing of life and a continual renewing of strength. Hallelujah to Jesus. But if you're going to be selfish, you may get back in the worst mess you was in to begin with. Jesus said to one fellow one time, we'll get around to it before we get through with these discussions here. Jesus said to one person one time, go and sin no more lest the worst thing come on you. You know, selfishness is sin. I said, you know, selfishness is sin. Amen. Problem with us a lot of times, we've had so much do's and don'ts until people think, well, if I don't kill anybody and I don't commit adultery, I'm all right. And the same people are just so selfish until it stinks. Selfishness is sin. Well, what are we going to do with the new strength and healing and health that's ours? We're going to serve the Lord. That's what we're going to do. Hallelujah. We're going to serve the Lord. And by serving the Lord, that means that we're going to minister to others. Minister to others. Forgetting ourselves. Praise God. Put God first. Put others second. And put ourselves last. Too many people reverse the order and put themselves first and others second and God last. But that's not good and that won't work. Praise God. It's a, it's a blessed change of responsibility. He has healed her. She is healed. She arose immediately and ministered to them. Praise God. Hallelujah to Jesus. I think a lot of times, a lot of us, we're going around quoting promises. My God promised he'll do it. Supply all your need according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. And he will do it, but we don't give him a chance to do it. The reason that isn't working for some folks is they're squandering it all on themselves. It's always me, mine, and ours, and so on and so forth. Put God first. Hallelujah to Jesus. I'll tell you, I found out through the many years that if I just put God first and put others second, and just be interested in blessing others and helping folks. I didn't have to keep a holler and he'll supply all of my needs. It just automatically worked. Amen. Amen. I just get so interested in helping others. Just get so interested in helping others. So concerned about others. To want to bless them. Oh, God, make me a blessing. I wake up praying nearly every morning. God, make me a blessing. Make me a blessing. I don't pray for a blessing. I'm already blessed with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Make me a blessing. Help me to help somebody today. Help me to help somebody with the same help that you've helped me with. And that's all I'm doing is just helping folks with the same help that he's helped me with. Good health, friends, is the richest material blessing of our bodily life. And as everyone recognizes, it, it's one of our greatest needs. 
My God shall supply all your need. <laughs> Hallelujah. Some folks can't see healing. Well, my, 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 I see healing even in that verse. My God shall supply all your need. According to his riches in glory by Christ Jesus. Let me say it again. Good health is the richest material blessing of our bodily life. And as everyone recognizes, is one of our greatest needs. And my God shall supply all your need according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. Well, all right. Now, back to this thought, as I said, that we'd already mentioned. The late young lady was asked, why did she want to be healed? She said, so she could play tennis. Himself is the center of this thing. She ought to be healed because of himself, Jesus, because she could serve him better, because she could be a blessing to others. He should be the center of the whole thing. I think sometimes, in some cases, I don't think this is so in every case, but in some cases, that people need to get their eyes and their mind off of the healing and on him. And I think in some cases, the reason is not being manifested because they're just looking at the healing alone and forgot about him. Himself took our infirmities and bare our sicknesses. Praise God. Hallelujah to Jesus. Say it out loud with your own mouth. Say it loud enough with your mouth that your ears can hear your voice say it. And let your heart agree with it. Heavenly Father, Heavenly Father I thank you today, I thank you today because, I've been born again. because I've been born again. I am born of God. I am thy very own child. I am thy very own child. Thou art my very own father. Thou art my very own father. Thank you for the new birth. Thank you for the new birth. Thank you for your great plan of redemption. Thank you for your great plan of redemption. And I thank you, my father, that in that plan of redemption, there is not only the remission of sins. And the, new birth, and the new birth, but there is healing for my physical body. For it is written, we just read it in Matthew 8, 17. It is written, himself took our infirmities and bare our sicknesses. Therefore himself, Therefore himself took my infirmities, took my infirmities and bare my, my sicknesses. What he bore, what he bore I, need not bear. I need not bear. Because he bore them, because he bore them I'm, free. I'm free. I'm healed. I'm healed. Oh, hallelujah. Yes. Woo! Put your other hand up and thank it. Put your other hand up and thank it. For more information about Kenneth Hagen Ministries, call 1-888-283-2484 or visit our website at rhema.org or write Kenneth Hagen Ministries, P.O. Box 50126, Tulsa, Oklahoma, 74150-0126. And in Canada, visit rhemacanada.org or write Kenneth Hagen Ministries, P.O. Box 335, Station D, Etobicoke, Ontario, Canada, M9A4X3.